Have you ever had one of those moments where in relationship where you're hurt, somebody does sin against you, they were wrong and they hurt you and you really just want to hold it over their head? You know what I'm talking about? Uh, uh, Several years ago at summer camp, this happened to me. Uh, Every year we do summer camp for the high school and middle schoolers. It's awesome. It's like a tornado of fun and exhaustion. And this particular year, this is a picture of of us uh, as we were getting ready for summer camp, a totally tubular summer camp. It was 80s themes. There there I am with my Flavor Flav uh, clock around my neck. And uh, uh, at summer camp, I was a team leader. And about day four, my grace tank is at about 10% trending downward. I'm exhausted. I'm just shoving sugar and caffeine in my body as quickly as I can to like maintain some semblance of humanity. And uh, Ryan Cripps, the family director in South Umpqua, he's another team leader. And about day four, he's decided we are his mortal enemy. We are his more. He doesn't just want to defeat us in games. He wants to destroy us and demoralize us. And Ryan's pretty quick witted. And so he could really jeer at us. And, and his team kind of came up with this chant to kind of mock us. And it was, it was all good fun and games until they put a fart bomb in our bathroom. Okay. Now our whole cabin stinks. And then they just kept at it. And there was a line that they began to cross. Day four, we're up the pool games. It's kind of the epitome of the week. And my team isn't involved in this game at this point. And so I'm wearing jeans and my shoes and socks. You probably see where this is going. And I'm sitting on the side of the pool watching the game happen. And on the other side was Ryan and his team. And they're jeering at us and mocking us. And it was all in good fun. But all of a sudden, Ryan's gone. Ryan's missing. And like, this is not good. And as I'm looking around, like, where'd he go? All of a sudden, I'm shoved out into the middle of the pool. And as I am am falling into the water, I look back to try and catch a glimpse of who in the world just did this to me and whose face do I see but Ryan Glenn Cripps. And his little smirk as I went under the water, I promise you, everything going through my mind in that moment was not godly. (laughs) Like, I was so mad. And my honest response was, I just shut down relationship. You hurt me. You've taken it too far. This is too much. I have to now lead my team who feels demoralized. And I shut him down. I ignored him. I gave him the silent treatment. And it really inhibited what we were trying to accomplish with uh, uh, presenting Jesus to the kids as leaders. And on one of the last days, Ryan came to me. He's like, hey, man, uh, you know, I'm really sorry if I took it too far. I, it was not my intention. I was just trying to get the kids riled up and excited. And in that moment, I had the opportunity for, to forgive. But if I'm honest with you, I didn't want to, and I didn't. And we've since made up and, and worked through the situation, but it's that moment where the wrong was done against me, and I wanted to hold it over their head instead of extending forgiveness. As followers of Christ, we are called to extend radical forgiveness. And throughout this series, Better Together, we're going to continue that today. But throughout this series, we've come to this conclusion that we want to be a community on purpose and with a purpose. On purpose because community doesn't happen on accident. And with a purpose because we want to live out the mission of God in the world. But one of the things that can get in the way of living out that mission, of living out being a community on purpose and with a purpose is a lack of forgiveness in our community. That when we're hurt, when we're sinned against, do we actually extend the grace we're called to extend? Because the reality is everybody in community is going to be hurt by their community at some point. Sometimes it's going to be a deep wound. And the radical call of the gospel is because you and I have been forgiven, we are now called to extend forgiveness. That's the title of the message. I know it's pretty extravagant, but we're called to extend forgiveness. And it's interesting, Jesus, in all of the gospels, he never really defines forgiveness for us. He doesn't like give a theological dissertation on here's what forgiveness is. There's no essay format of him explaining this, but Jesus lives it out. 
He shows grace to the, the insiders in his group. I mean, think about the people in his group. He had, he had a tax collector working for the Roman government and a zealot who wanted to overthrow Rome. I mean, can you imagine there's some need in that circle to extend grace? So Jesus learned this with his friends, but also the spiritual outsiders of the day, the, the, the women of ill repute or, or uh, even the Pharisees. He's calling them like, I wish you would just come to me with repentance that you might be forgiven of your sins. Over and again, we see Jesus forgiving people, but he never defines it. So I have a kind of a functional definition for us today. This is from my pea-sized brain, so don't take it to the bank, but I think this reflects what we see in Scripture Forgiveness, specifically forgiveness between a brother and sister, brothers and sisters in Christ, is a supernatural, grace-empowered laying down of sin. Supernatural because you and I don't have this ability of our own accord. We have to receive forgiveness from God, experience forgiveness from Jesus before we can extend it to our community. A supernatural, grace-empowered laying down of sin done against you. And if we're honest, I think everybody, we really wrestle with this. When we're hurt, this is not our natural response. And so today, we're going to look at Jesus and how he lays out forgiveness in his community, and specifically with one of his close friends, Peter. Now, a little bit of background to our story. Uh, We heard a couple weeks ago the story of Jesus and his disciples at the Last Supper, Uh, After that moment, the disciples get into an argument about who's the greatest. And then Jesus has some very sobering words for his buddy, Peter. Here's what he says, Luke 22. By the way, we're going to be in Luke 22, uh, 31 to about 52. And then we're also going to be in John uh, 21, 15 to 17. So if you need to open your Bibles, that's kind of where we're going to be today in two different chunks, looking at the story of Peter's denial. All right, so Jesus says, verse 31, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Now put yourself in Peter's shoes right now. Jesus, the guy that you've seen over and over and over again, knows what he's talking about, tells you Satan's out to get you. I don't know about you, but I'd be like, what? Like the Satan? Are you sure you read the email right, Jesus? Sure it wasn't like Sabin? Like with a B, there's not the bad guy, like the bad guy of all bad guys, the devil, he's out to get me. What? Hold me, Jesus. Like I'd be terrified in this moment. And Jesus says, there's sin coming. You're going to be sifted. You're you're going to be attacked. But I've prayed for you. And when you return, strengthen your brothers. When you return, When you've returned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. (laughs) Like there's no humbleness in Peter in this moment. He hears that the bad guy of all bad guys is out to get him. And he's like, "Uh, Jesus, I know you're a little concerned. And I know that I've seen you get like 99.9% of the things right. Like I've seen you heal people. I've seen you uh, predict things that come true. But you've got me pegged wrong. Satan's no match for my spiritual prowess. <laughs> just, can you imagine the audacity of Peter to make this statement? Like, Satan's coming to get you. Jesus, I'll go with you to the grave, buddy. Well, I got this on lock, man. And Jesus clarifies for Peter what's going to happen. Verse 34, Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. Three times that you know me. He's saying, look, Peter, you're not listening. This is going to happen. You're going to wander in sin. You're going to rebel. You're going to deny me. I know you can make this great proclamation right now, but this is coming. You need to prepare for this. I'm praying for you. And we all know what happens after this. Jesus goes and he wrestles with God in the garden. Then he's arrested. Judas and his thugs with, the, with clubs and swords from the high priest's house come. And they, uh, they arrest Jesus, Peter, in a brash act. He tries to chop off a dude's ear. Jesus heals it, said, that's not what we're about, Peter. And then Peter watches as his Lord, master, and friend is arrested, become a prisoner, and is dragged off to go through a mock trial. Luke 22, further down in the passage, the story continues. Then they seized him, that's Jesus, and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following it at a distance. 
Isn't that interesting? The Peter before who said, man, I'm with you. Let's go Uh, to death. Death before dishonor, Jesus. Now he's, it appears, he's afraid. He's following at a distance. He's disassociating from Jesus because he sees the ramifications of, of following the radical call that God has for Jesus. He's following at a distance. And and when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. So here's what's happening. There's this, Jesus is going to the high priest's house. He's been put through a mock trial. They're beating him. They're spitting on him. They're they're bringing trumped up charges against him. They're lying about him. And Peter's following. And there's some people out in the courtyard warming themselves by the fire. And Peter's watching this whole thing unfold from a distance. While he's sitting there, verse 56 says, Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. This man will. So this girl is sitting there, and she's like intently looking at, G- at Peter. And like, I know you. You were with him, dude. And the implication is, well, maybe you need to be a part of this trial too, because you know this guy. But he denied it, saying, woman, I do not know him. He says, I don't know him. What are you talking about? Now, let's pause for a moment. Peter knew Jesus very well. Not only was he one of the 12 disciples, he was one of the inner three, Peter, James, and John, three close friends of Jesus who were there for intimate moments with Jesus, right? These are the guys who saw his glory at the transfiguration. These are the guys who Jesus bore his heart to in the Garden of Gethsemane. And now he's saying, I don't even know this man. And it continues on. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you are, you are also one of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. So the first uh, time he denied, they said, you know him. He says, I don't know them. Now they're saying, you're one of his disciples. You're one of them. You, you sat under his teaching. And Peter says, no, I'm not. So I don't know Jesus. I'm not one of his disciples, but it doesn't stop there. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. In another passage in Matthew, it says that his accent kind of betrayed him, right? They're like, look, we can tell where you're from. We can tell that you came with this guy. Your accent betrays you. It's obvious, man. Like, it's like you can tell that somebody's from South County by how they say the word creek, right? It's not Myrtle Creek, it's Myrtle Crick, right? They're like, Peter, dude, we can tell. And Peter continues the denial. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. He's playing daft. I don't know what you're talking about, man. And immediately, while he was still speaking, The rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Can you imagine this moment? The lies are coming out of his mouth. The rooster crows, and this is the moment where the cogs in Peter's brain begin to turn, and he begins to realize, oh my word, what Jesus said I would do, I just did it. Like we don't see him stopping after the first time uh, denying Jesus, saying, oh, Dang it, Jesus told me I was going to do that. I'm going to try, try better. I'm going to trust him. We don't see him doing that. It's as though Peter is blinded to what he's doing, fulfilling the prediction of Jesus to a T. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And when I used to read this passage, I used to think that this was uh, Jesus's like angry look at Peter. You know, like that parent look where you're just frustrated with your kids and you look at them like, knock it off. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I thought this was the knock it off, Peter. But as I've studied and God has transformed my view of who Christ is, I don't think that's at all what was happening here. In fact, the word that's used in the original language, when the Lord turned and looked, the word looked there, I can't say it and I'm not even going to try because the Greek word is super weird, but it connotes a, a, a care and a concern. So here's the scene. Jesus is over there being beaten, mocked, and lied about. And his gaze and his heart and his mind turn to his wayward friend. 
This isn't a look of judgment. This is a look of love. And then Peter begins to put things together. Peter remembered the saying of the Lord and how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. This is an ugly cry. This isn't like a few tears. This is Peter devastated at his action. This is a, the, the tears of conviction. And we know what happens. Jesus continues to go through these mock trials and the, and the mob is so bloodthirsty. They're not okay with him just being beaten within an inch of his life. They want him to die. And so he goes to the cross and dies taking the weight of the world's sin upon himself. There's separation between him and the Father in this moment, and he dies on the cross. Can you imagine what Peter felt in this moment? Like this is, this is the, the note that history is going to have on who I am for the rest of my life. Like all the disciples were struggling with, wait a minute, Jesus, I thought you said we were going to, we we're going to inaugurate a kingdom. All of them struggled, but I think Peter had a special grief. Because in Jesus' hour of darkness, Peter is over there sinning against him as he's looking at him with love. And I think Peter thought, it's over for me. This is what will go down in history as who Peter is. The failure who denied his master. And now he's dead. But three days later, Jesus didn't stay dead. Three days later, he rose again, confirming who he said he was all along, that he's God incarnate, that he's God in the flesh, that he's the son of God, the Messiah, the Christ. And there's an interesting interchange that the apostle John records for us in John chapter 21. Jesus isn't done with Peter yet. Peter sinned and it was big, but Jesus isn't done with Peter yet. Let's look at it. John 21, starting in verse 15. So a little bit of context here. They had just left uh, uh, and, 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 G and Peter's out uh, on, the, on the sea fishing. And he, he's really just kind of decided that like, you know, this new life that Jesus promised me, uh, that's over. I'm going to go back to what I know. I know I'm called to be a fisher of men, but uh, I know how to make, uh, I know how to catch fish. And that, that whole thing is over. I'm unworthy of that anymore because I betrayed him. So he's back out on the sea fishing and there's several of the disciples with him and they're fishing and Jesus shows up on the shore and he's cooking some breakfast on the, on the beach there. And uh, the fish, they put their fish nets down, they catch an insane amount of fish. And then when Peter realizes, when Peter realizes that it's Jesus on the shore, he jumps out of the boat. He puts his coat on, he jumps out of the boat and he begins running to the shore. Can you imagine that moment? The last time you saw this person, you betrayed them to their face. And I wonder if in Peter in that moment, as he jumps out of the boat, Peter's a, kind of an action first sort of dude. And then his emotions come later. He always kind of puts his foot in his mouth. He jumps out of the boat. And I wonder if on his journey to the shore, if he maybe thought, wait a minute, I don't deserve be here. I don't deserve to talk to Jesus. I don't deserve reconciliation. I, I don't deserve to sit with the master now that I've denied him. But he gets there and here's what Jesus does. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Now, Jesus knows the answer to this question. He's not, he's not, in the dark about Peter's, the state of Peter's heart. I think he's doing this for Peter. You see, Peter had a public proclamation of his denial before a crowd of people. And now Jesus is walking him through a process of restoration, of reinstatement, and of forgiveness. And he's saying, Peter, do you love me? Publicly. He goes on. He said to him, feed my lambs. And I love that. It, it's not as though Jesus had lambs all around him like he does in a lot of those paintings where he has the Goldilocks hair and just the sheep are everywhere. That, that's not what he's saying. This is metaphorical. He's saying, look, I'm not done with you yet, Peter. You're going to lead my people. You're going to care for the flock of God. You're going to care for the, the New Testament church. 
I got a mission for you. Your sin was not the end of the road for you. Again, he says a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend to my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? Like this is, this, Jesus, what are you getting at, man? Like we're, we're with other disciples here. This is kind of embarrassing. Like you're bringing up my history. You're bringing up my pain. You're bringing up the sin. He's grieved. He says, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. This Peter that we see here is a different man than who we saw in Luke 22. When Jesus told him, hey, you're going to be sifted like wheat by Satan himself. Peter's like, I don't think you know what you're talking about, Jesus. I got this. Now he's saying, Jesus, you know everything. This sin, this failure, and the restoration that Jesus is bringing him through is helping him to see and trust in his Savior. You know everything. I do love you. Jesus is not done with Peter. The the sin was not the end of the mission for him. And in our community, sin can't inhibit the mission for us either. And so we're going to look back through a couple pieces in this passage. I just want to pull out some ideas that I think will help us walk through forgiveness in a healthy way as we see Jesus doing that here. The first thing, I want to look at Jesus' prediction to Peter. Look at what he says. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. He says, Peter, you're going to sin, but let's pull back the eternal curtain here. There's something happening that you don't see happening. Satan himself is out to get you. He's out to destroy this community. He's already taken out Judas by entering him and causing him to betray Jesus. And now he's, he's messing with Peter. Satan is trying to tear apart this community that Jesus has built because he knows if he can tear apart the community, the mission's not going forward. And so he's saying, look, there's a spiritual reality that's happening here that Satan is going to tempt you and you're going to fall, but I'm praying for you. And I love that Jesus is already talking about his restoration. He says, when you've turned, strengthen your brothers. He says, I'm not done with you yet, Peter. And I think this is such an important idea that when people sin against us, that we realize, yes, they're responsible for that sin. It doesn't, doesn't negate their responsibility, but the reality is there is a spiritual darkness behind the curtains of this world that we can't see going on. Those who sin against us aren't the enemy, but victims of the enemy. Those who sin against us aren't our enemy, Right? It feels like it. When, when the pain is real and it's right there, it feels like it. But they're victims of the enemy. But if Satan can convince us that this person's the enemy and this person's the enemy and this person, you know what that does? That isolates us. And Satan's a roaring lion who loves to taste the sheep. And if he can isolate you by causing you to wall up from the rest of your community and labeling everybody else enemies, you're, you're in for it. And so when we are sinned against, the person who sinned against us isn't the enemy. They're a victim of Satan, the big enemy. The next thing I want us to look at is in the denial. So Peter, he, he, he makes this bold claim that he's going to go to prison for Jesus or die. But then verse 57, 58, and 60. Woman, I don't know him. Who's this Jesus guy you're talking about? When he's, when he's called one of the disciples, man, I am not. And then when the guy says, hey, I know you're from Galilee. You've got to be with him. He says, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, what are, what are you talking about? And there's actually a, a monument to Peter's sin. It looks like this. Pastor Craig showed me this uh, uh, last week. And uh, this is a, pi- a picture of it where Peter is there. 
and the servant girl, and there's a, a, a guard, and on top is the rooster. There's a monument immortalizing Peter's sin in stone and metal. Like you and I mess up, but at least they don't create monuments out of our messes, right? But in this moment where Peter sinned, it would have been really easy. I mean, Jesus of all people could have held it over his head. He's God, but we don't see Jesus doing that. What is your response to sin done against you? If you're honest, what's your real response? You see, I think there's several different types of responses and probably there's a lot more than what I could come up with, but there's a few categories that I I see often play out in my own life and in the lives of others. The first one is to retaliate, right? When we're sinned against, the the stone is thrown at us, we pick up a bigger stone and we throw it harder and faster, right? With the pain hurts and so we want to make them hurt. And God actually talks about this. He says, don't repay evil for evil. He calls us to to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. Retaliation is is saying, you hurt me, so I want you to hurt equally or greater. And retaliation is not a gospel response to sin. It may feel good in the moment, but it's not a gospel response to sin. Because you and I are not just judges. There's only one who is. It's God. And we can entrust him when others sin against us. That's the first one. The second is we can isolate, right? We can wall up from others. This is why I did it Ryan, uh, uh, to Ryan rather at summer camp. When, when he sinned against me and it hurt, I just shut down relationship. In the early 1900s, there was a couple of brothers named the Collier brothers, Homer and Langley. And they were pretty eccentric guys. They were well off and, and they were actually hoarders. Uh, their house was just brimming with stuff everywhere. And they had little pathways through their house. And at one point, Homer went blind and Langley was the one who had to provide for him. And uh, they were kind of ostracized from community because they were so awkward and, and, and people just thought of them as a weird rich folk. And so they actually set traps all over their house to keep people out of their life. And ultimately one day, as Langley's going to provide a meal to Homer, he's climbing through one of the tunnels in their hoard. He falls prey to one of his own traps. And they both died alone in their home because they had isolated from community. Maybe that's where you're at. But when sin's done against you, you just shut it down. Right? You set up traps like you're not getting in here. Isolation is not a gospel response to sin. And this is the one I struggle with, to be honest. That when people sin against me, I want to just shut them down. But that doesn't deal with the sin. That doesn't deal with the need for grace. It's not a gospel response. The third one uh, that I often see is ignoring. We just sweep it under the rug. We pretend like it didn't happen. It's okay. Uh, I'm okay. We're okay. And you sweep it under the rug until the rug is more like a decorative throw on top of a mountain of pain. You can ignore it, but it doesn't go away. And the pain will speak loud. And eventually, if you ignore it long enough, you'll live from the pain. This is, a, this is often a response that I see. I also struggle with this one. But ignoring the pain is not a gospel response to sin. There's only one gospel response to sin. It's forgiveness, right? Like think about this reality, that person that maybe God has placed on your heart right now that, that you, you don't want to forget or you're struggling, you're wrestling through it. And maybe it's been decades and you're wrestling with, how do I forgive this person? Scripture tells us that God pursued us while we were yet sinners, right? That we didn't have it all together when God pursued us, that he forgives us, that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And as we've received that kind of forgiveness, now we can extend it to those around us. The only proper gospel response to sin for a brother and sister in Christ is Forgiveness. Now, that doesn't always mean that it means restoration of relationship. 
but it does mean we work through the process of forgiveness. We're going to outline that here in a few moments. But I wanted to come back to this, this picture of the Lord where he's looking at Peter in the midst of his sin with love. Because his desire for Peter is that Peter would not be defined by this moment, but that he would be restored, renewed, and set on mission. And I want to look at the restoration. The restoration. This is after Jesus has already asked him twice, do you love me? And Peter says, "Uh, you know everything. You know that I love you. He says, feed my sheep. Jesus brings him through this process of restoration where Peter now has time to not undo, but to to repent and publicly positively confess his love for Jesus, just like he publicly confessed his denial of Jesus. Jesus is bringing him through a process and forgiveness for you and I is no less of a process. And I think it, it begins like this, uh, from the heart of a passage in Ephesians, Ephesians 4, 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. We are called to forgive the same way that God in Christ forgives us. That's holy and completely. And we can't do that apart from Jesus. Here's what the process looks like. This is adapted from a book by Chip Ingram, um, But it it begins with the choice to forgive, right? The sin is done, but it begins with a choice. You're choosing to forgive. Forgiveness does not mean it's okay. I deal with that with my kids a lot. When there's sin in the relationship between between them, it's not okay. If it's sin, it requires forgiveness. And so there's this choice, this initial choice to forgive. But the problem is, is when you see the person again or when you you, uh, come up against the, the situation again, or you're at the place again, those feelings may come right back up. And that's why the next step in the process is continuing to forgive, forgiving. That every time you think about that person, that place, that thing that happened, you choose, Lord, I've chosen to forgive them. Help me to live that out. Lord, I've chosen to forgive them. Help me to live that out. That little arrow prayer that says, uh, God, help me do this. And some sin takes months. Some t- sin takes Years, some sin takes decades of choosing every time you think about that situation to forgive as God in Christ forgave you. And ultimately one day you'll be able to look at that situation, that sin, that pain and say they're truly forgiven. Doesn't mean we're reconciled necessarily depending on what the sin was. Some sins don't require uh, reconciliation in relationship but I can think about it and I don't have malice anymore. I was talking about this with, with Heather Jones, our life group director. And she said, you know, you may have some, some frustrated feelings or you may, you know, feel like I don't want to trust that person. And that's a negative feeling. It's not that you don't have negative feelings. It's that you're not controlled by malice and rage and anger anymore. You've been released from that. You see, if we're not willing to work through this process, not only will, will forgiveness or an unforgiveness be a prison for that person, it will also be a prison for us. I want to come back to that picture of the monument to Peter's sin. What if we thought of this not as a monument to sin, but as a monument to the grace of God? That Jesus looked directly at Peter's sin and said, I'm not done with you yet. And the Peter we see in the book of Acts in chapters three and four is a completely changed man. Why? Because he's experienced authentic, real grace. He's experienced forgiveness, that that supernatural grace empowered laying down of the sin done against you. Peter's experienced it. And now he can go out and publicly proclaim without any concern for his own well-being the grace of Jesus in the gospel of God. What if we got to do that for others? That as we forgive and we release people from the sin they've done against us, what mission might they go out and live as we release them and ourselves from that prison? I'm gonna go ahead and release to the campuses. Jesus loves you guys, so do I. Have a great day. Thank you guys so much for joining us. It's, it's a joy to be here with you in this space. Uh, and I just want to leave us with a couple of challenges, right? 
Forgiveness is a, is a difficult thing. Sin is messy. And so forgiveness isn't this pretty packaged little thing we can just hand out. It's tough. And so I think we need some practical tools on how to live this out. The first thing uh, I, I want to challenge us to with this question, have you received forgiveness from God? Like, like the initial forgiveness, yes, but maybe there's some areas in your life that you're just not believing the truth about the gospel, that God really forgives you for those things. Have you received the forgiveness? Ask God for the faith to believe that he could really forgive you. Past, present, and future, holy and completely, unconditional love is yours in Christ. Ask for the faith to receive that, to believe that in prayer today. And this is so crucial because if we haven't received forgiveness, if we haven't experienced forgiveness, we can't extend it. And so uh, the second thing I want to challenge us to is, who do you need to forgive? Now, maybe as you're sitting here today, uh, you, God's churning in your heart and you know exactly who it is that you need to forgive. And, and maybe it's an uncomfortable feeling where the Holy Spirit is convicting and, and it, maybe it's, it's, it's a real challenge. I want to challenge you to take a step in that forgiveness process today. That if it's an old wound that, can, that can't be uh, direct face-to-face forgiven, begin praying for that person. Begin praying for their blessing. But as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everybody. So if it is somebody in your community that has hurt you, I want to challenge all of us to go to that person and extend grace. Remember, forgiveness does not mean it's okay. It means it's not okay. Jesus shows us that sin is a big deal because God had to die. So forgiveness doesn't mean it's okay. It means it's not okay, but I'm choosing to lay it down. It's that supernatural, grace-empowered laying down of the sin done against me. Let me pray for us. God, thank you so much that while we were yet sinners, you died for us, that you pursued us in the midst of our sin to forgive us. And I pray, God, that as we wrestle with the people in our hearts that, that have hurt us, that we've led in and have hurt us, that you would, um, you would enable us to extend that kind of grace, that you would empower us to extend the forgiveness that we've received. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Lastly, I want to challenge us uh, as we've been walking through the blessed rhythms, right? That we begin in prayer, we, we listen and engage people, we eat with them, we serve them. And lastly, we want to lean into the idea of sharing. This is where your story of what God has done in your life is, is shared with those around you who maybe don't know Christ. So as you are uh, trying to live out these blessed rhythms, I want you to think, begin thinking and praying, how can I share my story of what God has done in my life with others around me? Thanks again for joining us. Love you guys.